before we look at all the nasty little critters that are going to burrow into our bodies and cause us problems, I think it might be useful to do a quick overview of the different categories of organisms that make up life on Earth. So we'll start with a discussion of what life actually is, and then I'll talk about how we classify and name different groups of organisms, and that can be rather tricky. We'll talk about the major groups of organisms that we'll be studying in this course, and I'll talk about what makes each of those groups unique and special. And like I said before, I come from kind of a place where I don't think any critter is horrible. I think they're all pretty amazing. And I'm going to share with you how they're amazing and what makes the different groups unique. But of course, our focus is going to be how to use that information against them. Now, I've shown you this diagram before. I just want to reiterate that we're looking at tiny organisms when we look at microbes. Microbes, by definition, are things that are too small to be seen with the naked eye. But I am throwing in some larger organisms as well. I'm going to throw in some multicellular parasites, and also some multicellular vectors, things like ticks and mosquitoes, because they can transfer pathogens. So this is the range of what we're looking at, and it's a pretty huge range. Once again, be familiar with those different units of measure that we're going to use, especially when we're working in the lab, and be able to convert between them. And just for a sense of scale, this is the size of a human hair. If you want to get a good sense of how huge the universe is and understand the scale of the universe, I invite you to visit this interactive website called Scale of the Universe 2. Apparently the first universe wasn't quite up to snuff. But anyway, there's a link to that at the bottom. And you can interact with this website. You can zoom in and out and get a sense of how small the microbes are that we're going to look at. So at the bottom here, you'll see a scale and it says 10 to the point one at the bottom. This is showing us our field of view. You can see that in the middle of the field of view, we have a circle that has a diameter of one meter. So as we kind of navigate this website, we're also going to be looking at scientific notation. Remember, if we have something that's multiplied by 10 to the zero, it is one unit across. So within that one meter circle, we see a few interesting things, including Russell's teapot. I'm not going to get into that, but I invite you to look up Russell's teapot. It's an interesting commentary on the philosophy of science, untestable hypotheses, Occam's razor, etc. We'll zoom in further and we get down to objects like ants and sleet and so on and things that we can still see with the naked eye. Now we're down to a circle that has a diameter of one millimeter. So one times 10 to the negative third meters. Remember a millimeter is one one thousandth of a meter. We're getting close to the smallest things that you can see with your eye. And you can see that in the little circle. An oven, ovum, sorry, a human egg cell is the largest cell in the human body, and it's just visible to the naked eye. You can see the width of a human hair as well. You can just make that out with your eye, although it's kind of difficult to focus on. We're going to zoom in a bit further and take a look at some microbes and other cells that we might run across in the course. So remember, most of the cells within the human body are quite a bit smaller than an egg cell. So you can see a typical skin cell here. Uh, we zoom in a little bit further. We can see a white blood cell. We can see the width of a silk fiber. So a strand of uh, protein that's been squeezed out the butt of a caterpillar. And we can also see a red blood cell, which is smaller still. We can see chromosomes smaller still, mitochondria smaller still. Again, all of these things are too small to see with the naked eye. We can see a cell nucleus as well, of course, which is where we're going to find DNA. Now, as we get down smaller, we're now looking at a circle that is one micrometer across. So one times 10 to the negative six 
micrometers. Remember, one micrometer is one one thousandth of uh, a millimeter, which is one one thousandth of a meter. We have some large viruses here that can be seen with a light microscope, but they only show up as little blurry dots. We can't see any detail whatsoever. If we want to see details on viruses, or if we even want to see them at all, we need an electron microscope. So you're seeing a circle there that represents the smallest thing that an optical or light microscope can see. And we keep zooming in. We need to use an electron microscope to do this, but we can see some molecules in rather blurry detail, not a whole lot of detail. We have to kind of work out the shape of these molecules using other means. Now we're down to one nanometer. So one times 10 to the negative nine meters. So one nanometer is one one thousandth of a micrometer. We could go down further and then we'd start using picometers, but we're not gonna do that so much in this course. But we might use picometers and even smaller units to describe the parts of an atom, the nucleus, and the parts that make up the nucleus, for instance. That's a bit beyond the realm of this course. We'll zoom out now, we'll go back to where we started. And again, please take some time and peruse this website yourself. It really is quite a lot of fun. I'll speed this up a little bit as we zoom out. Another video I would recommend that you track down if you're interested in this stuff. It's nothing I'm going to ask you about, but there's a video called Powers of Ten. There's a, the original version, which comes from the 1960s, which is one of my favorite little short films in science. And there's a, an updated version that is narrated by Morgan Freeman. It goes over this material as well, if this is something you're interested in. But of course, we could zoom out and out and out, and out, and out, and also move into the realm of astronomy and theoretic, uh, theoretical astronomy as well. So have a look. You'll hopefully enjoy it. In terms of structure, we have two broad categories of cells. We have the eukaryotic cells that possess a nucleus. So they have this membrane surrounded structure that contains the DNA. And then outside of that, they have some rather elaborate organelles. Then we have the prokaryotic cells. Prokaryotic cells do not have a nucleus. So typically their DNA is all bundled together in one area, but it's not defined by a membrane. It's not surrounded by a nuclear envelope. Also, they have far fewer organelles as we'll see. There are two types of prokaryotic cells. There are bacteria, which is what we'll be talking about in this course. And there's another group known as the archaea, which are not infectious. There are no pathogenic members that we know of. So we'll touch on them very briefly, but we won't be spending much time on them. Now note that we also have viruses. Viruses are not made up of cells. They are not generally considered to be living by most biologists, and they're also much smaller. So you're seeing these three types of entities here to scale. Notice that the prokaryotic cell is much smaller than the eukaryotic cell. On average, prokaryotic cells tend to be about one one hundredth the size of eukaryotic cells, although that does vary quite a bit. And viruses are much smaller still. So once again, we're seeing these different entities to scale. We have a red blood cell shown in the inset diagram in the upper left. Red blood cells are pretty small as eukaryotic cells go. They're also kind of unusual in that they break one of the rules I just mentioned. They actually don't have a nucleus. They lose their nucleus during development in mammals, not in other critters. Next to the red blood cell, we have an E. coli cell, and notice that it is much smaller. So again, on average, prokaryotic cells have about one one hundredth the volume of typical eukaryotic cells. In the next diagram, we see different 
virus particles next to an E. coli, and you'll notice that they are much smaller still. There's a few important viruses here that we'll talk about. The tobacco mosaic virus is a virus that infects tobacco, as the name might suggest. It's rather important historically because it was the first virus that was studied in detail and identified. We have bacteriophages, which are quite fascinating, complex viruses that don't infect us don't infect eukaryotic cells, they infect bacteria, as their name suggests. There's been a lot of research done lately to see if we can use bacteriophages to infect bacteria that are harmful to us. We've got the polio virus, which causes polio, we will talk about that briefly, and the smallpox virus, which of course historically was hugely important. Before we start defining the different categories of life, it makes sense that we actually define life itself. And that can be more difficult to do than you might think. All of the organisms that you're seeing here are quite different. We have bacteria and plants and fungi and protists, and we have animals like the cheetah. They all seem extremely different, but fundamentally they're not. All of the cells that are found in these organisms have to do the same stuff. They have to complete the same objectives. Now you might think that biologists have a pretty good handle on what life is. Not necessarily. If we're defining life, we can't look at one single characteristic. So you might think reproduction would be a good characteristic of living things. But there are some things out there that reproduce that aren't generally considered to be alive. A computer virus would be a good example. So a computer virus will use uh, your computer to make copies of itself, but I think most people would agree that a computer virus is not technically alive, at least not in a biological sense. And even a biological virus, like a coronavirus, for instance, is that alive? It can reproduce, but it doesn't have its own metabolism. It can't sustain itself on its own. It has to infect other cells, just like a computer virus has to infect computers. So when it comes to defining life, most biologists would agree there is no single defining feature. It's a set of features. And I've come up with a few that I think are applicable to all living things. Now there's some things that aren't here, and if I were to ask this question on a test, hint maybe, um, you don't have to give the ones I've got here, the seven I've got listed here. You might have some good ones yourself, and I invite you to um, offer those up as well. But I think when it comes to defining life, living things need to have these characteristics, or at least most of these characteristics. So living things possess order. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, living things are complicated, even the simplest of living things. Simple bacteria, they do a lot of remarkable stuff and they have ordered molecules within them. They have DNA, they have proteins, they have lipids. These are highly ordered molecules and they have to maintain that order. Now we'll talk about this later, but you may have heard of the word entropy before. And entropy refers to a tendency towards disorder. So in the universe, things tend towards randomness. If you have a complex molecule and you just let it sit out in the environment, it's gonna break down. If, let's say you take a drop of dye and you add it to a bathtub full of water, the molecules bump into each other, they rearrange themselves, they move all over the place, and they randomize themselves. They basically will randomly distribute themselves throughout the bath water. So unless something is applying energy to maintain structure and maintain order, order breaks down. Personally, I think maintaining order is one of the key aspects of life. Living cells and living things fight disorder. They expend energy 
in order to maintain order. And really, the food you eat, the oxygen you breathe in, your cells in your body are using that oxygen to liberate energy from your food, and that energy is being used to maintain the order of your cells. It's being used to maintain the order of your DNA and your proteins and so on. And once you stop doing that, the order breaks down. You spend your entire life fighting entropy. You spend your entire life using energy to fight breakdown, to fight disorder. And of course, when you die, you lose that battle and your body breaks down. Reproduction is another key aspect of living things. But as we talked about, there are some non-living things that can reproduce. So living things, living cells, living organisms make copies of themselves. Otherwise they go out of existence, they go extinct. Growth. So even if we're talking about a single cell, a single celled organism like an amoeba or a paramecium or something like that, they grow over their lifespan. So with an amoeba, it divides into two amoeba, two little amoeba, and they grow into bigger amoeba, and then they divide into two little amoeba, etc. And of course, if we're talking about complex organisms like humans, we start out as a single cell, and we grow into something that consists of a few hundred trillion cells, which is really remarkable when you think about it. So your parents contributed a sperm and an egg Maybe don't think about that part, but the sperm and the egg came together and they produced a cell called a zygote. And then that cell, over many, 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 many divisions, grew into you. Energy utilization. And typically this is all summed up as metabolism. So metabolism is the set of chemical reactions that occur in every cell in your body and what metabolism does is it makes energy available to you for growth and reproduction and maintaining order and all the other stuff you have to do. Next, living cells and living organisms need to respond to the environment. So if we look at a single celled organism like an amoeba, if the environment becomes, let's say, more acidic or more basic, the cell has to respond to that. Otherwise, it's not going to survive. And the same thing happens in your body. Cells have to respond to changes in the internal environment, the environment within your body. And that relates to homeostasis. Homeo means same. Uh, we're talking about maintaining the same environment within your body and within your cells. What I find quite fascinating is that the first cells evolved about 3.5, 3.8 billion years ago, and they maintain the environment that they evolved in. So the environment within a cell is very similar in terms of salinity and pH to the very ancient oceans where those cells first evolved. Every cell has to maintain its pH, it has to maintain um, you know, other properties inside that cell. Your body maintains a specific temperature, etc., so that all of those cells are happy. So if the environment changes, the cell will respond to the environment and maintain its internal environment. The internal environment of the cell stays about the same. And finally, evolutionary adaptation. So cells and organisms do change over time. And this isn't a, a willful thing. It's, it's just due to the fact that cells and organisms that aren't adapted to their environment die out. The ones that are adapted to their environment live on, reproduce, and pass the genetic material that you know, determines their specific properties to the next generation. So life will evolve and change over time to match the environment and to match the needs of that organism. So as I mentioned, I think these are a pretty good list 
of factors that define life, you could probably come up with a few more. You might say things like getting rid of waste, uh, taking in food, that kind of thing. I would say that those are part of energy utilization. Um, energy utilization doesn't have to be taking in food and breaking it down. It could also be making your own food using photons of light, which is what plants do. Uh, but we'll, we'll come back to metabolism later and we'll talk about it in lots of detail, maybe even more detail than you want to know. So do viruses meet the list of criteria that we just laid out? No, they don't. They fit a few of the points. They have genetic material. They are complex structures. Those are things we associate with living things. But they don't have their own metabolism. They can't liberate energy on their own and use that energy to fight entropy. They can't replicate themselves. They need help with that. They need to enter into a cell and trick the cell into replicating the genetic material and decoding that material and manufacturing all the bits and pieces and even assembling those bits and pieces to make new virus. So they're fascinating little entities but most biologists would not classify them as being alive. Now, if you talk to a medical researcher who maybe doesn't care about the philosophy of viruses so much and is more interested in controlling them and studying how they replicate, they might speak of them as being living things. And we actually give them names in the same sense that we would living cells. But again, they don't do all the stuff they have to do to be considered a life form. In many ways, the analogy of a computer virus is a good one. In fact, there's a reason that people came up with this term for programs that can self-replicate. A computer virus can't do anything outside of a computer. If it's sitting on your flash drive, it's just sitting there. It's just a bit of code. It's doing nothing at all. It needs to have hardware and software in order to replicate. And that's exactly what happens with viruses. They need the hardware and the software of your cells or they can't do anything at all. This lecture is a very brief overview of the categories of potentially pathogenic organisms that we're going to talk about in this course. Now we will talk about each of these groups in more detail. In fact, they're each going to get their own topic so we can give them the time that they deserve. Broadly speaking, we can divide potential pathogens into two broad groups. We have those that are acellular, A means without, so these are things that are not made up of cells. That would be the viruses and the prions. What's left are the living things, things that are made up of cells, and we can have two types of cells involved. We can have prokaryotes that are made up of prokaryotic cells, and they are single-celled organisms although the cells may form chains in some cases. And then we have the eukaryotes, which can be unicellular, so consisting of one cell, or they can be multicellular. They consist of clumps of cells. So within the prokaryotic cells, we can further divide that into the bacteria and the archaea. We'll be talking about the bacteria quite a lot. We won't be talking about the archaea very much at all because again, they do not cause infections. At least we don't know of any that cause infections. Within the eukaryotes, we have protists. The ones that cause us problems are unicellular, but be aware there are multicellular protists, uh, things like seaweed. Kelp, for instance, which can be very large and is a multicellular organism, is actually a protist, but of course kelp is not infectious. Algae can be single-celled or multicellular. Again, though, they're photosynthetic. They can make their own food. They don't have to bother infecting other creatures. Fungi can be either unicellular or multicellular, and animals are all multicellular. The animal parasites that we're talking about are things like tapeworms. What you're seeing here are the three broad categories of life. These are known as domains. So we have domain bacteria, domain archaea, domain eukarya. These categories are bigger than kingdoms on the classification scheme. Bacteria and archaea 
have been around for a very long time. We can trace them back to a universal ancestor that appeared about 3.8 billion years ago. Eukarya are younger, maybe as much as a billion years younger, but they've still been around for at least 2.8 billion years. And Eukarya are an offshoot of Archaea. Incidentally, the name Archaea means old cell. Think of archaeology. Archae means old. Archaeology is the study of old stuff. Archaea, old cells. Now, Eukarya are an offshoot of Archaea, and we know that based on their biochemistry. They do a lot of things that are similar to the way Archaea do things. They have a similar way of processing DNA, for instance, and we'll get into some of that in a little bit of detail later on. But the Eukarya also contain contributions from bacteria. There was a lot of swapping going on between these groups during their early evolution. Note that in the bacteria branch, mitochondria are right at the top of that branch. It's thought that the mitochondria that you have in your cells and that most eukarya have in their cells are derived from bacteria. They're actually enslaved entire bacteria cells that are now an integral part of the cell. They've become organelles. There's lots of evidence for this. We'll talk about that later as well. But within the mitochondria, for instance, we have DNA. They have their own DNA. They copy their own DNA. They have their own machinery for interpreting their own DNA. Chloroplasts, similarly, were also donated by bacteria. So chloroplasts were derived from a bacterium similar to a cyanobacteria that became incorporated into algae and then were passed on to plants. So again, another organelle that contains DNA and contains lots of other bits of evidence about its bacterial past. Note on the eukarya branch, we are right at the top. So we are animals, we're multicellular eukaryotes that ingest nutrition. We also have the fungi and the plants up there as well. These are all groups that you're hopefully familiar with and maybe even could describe. The other groups there, maybe not so much. We'll talk about some of those other groups. They're mostly composed of unique unicellular organisms, some of which are pathogenic. Here we have a typical prokaryotic cell. Um, to be more specific, this is a typical bacterial cell. The one thing to note right off the bat is that we don't have a nucleus. We don't have DNA being segregated from the rest of the cytosol by a membrane of some sort. Instead, we have one huge circle of DNA. That's different too. So we have one circular chromosome instead of a lot of separate linear or straight bits of DNA. So if we looked at a human cell, let's take a, a skin cell, for instance. In a skin cell, we have 23 unique chromosomes. You have two sets of chromosomes, of course, one that you got from your father and one from your mother. And those chromosomes consist of straight pieces of DNA. They're going to be confined within a nucleus. In a bacterial cell, we have one massive loop of DNA that contains most of the information within the cell. So imagine if you took a big rubber band and you twisted it up and twisted it up until it kind of compacted down. That's the situation that we're seeing here. Outside of the chromosome, we have additional DNA, which is also found in circles. Circles are rather special when it comes to prokaryotic cells. They always have their DNA within a circle. So we have these little bits of circular DNA that are known as plasmids. Plasmids are much, much smaller. In fact, this diagram doesn't do it justice here. The plasmids are much smaller. They wouldn't be visible if they were shown to scale with the chromosome. The plasmids contain just a few genes. One, maybe as many as four or five genes, but that's about it. We don't have a whole lot in the way of organelles either. We don't have a Golgi body. We don't have rough and smooth ER. We do have ribosomes, but we don't have the more extensive, more 
complex organelles that you would associate with a eukaryotic cell. Another thing to note is that the flagellum, if it's present, doesn't wave back and forth like it would in a eukaryote, instead it spins. There's a little electric motor at the base of the flagellum that spins it around, kind of like if you're spinning a skipping rope. A lot of prokaryotic cells will have a rather thick capsule uh, that surrounds them and protects them, and that's something we'll talk about in more detail. This is something that's composed of proteins and other components. Let's break down the term eukaryotic. Karyo means kernel, and that refers to the nucleus. So a eukaryotic cell has a nucleus. Eu means true. Whenever you see eu at the beginning of a word, it means true. So we have a true kernel cell. It has this nucleus. It has this little nugget in the middle that contains the DNA. Of course, we don't see that in prokaryotic cells. Incidentally, prokaryotic, pro means before, before the nucleus. These are cells that popped up earlier. They do not have a nucleus. Around the nucleus, we have the rough endoplasmic reticulum. In fact, you can see in this diagram that it's an extension of the nuclear envelope. We also have smooth ER, which consists of a bunch of little tubes. And we have mitochondria, which are incorporated bacteria, as we discussed briefly and will discuss in more detail. We have the Golgi complex. We have a whole bunch of other stuff that's going on. So structurally, the eukaryotic cell is more complex. When it comes to the cilia or flagella that might attach to a eukaryotic cell, they're not always there, but if there are cilia or flagella attached to the cell, they don't spin, they actually wave back and forth. Let's compare the two cell types in a bit more detail. So in prokaryotes, again, we have DNA that's found in circles. It's always in circles. So we have a great big circle of DNA. That's the single chromosome of a prokaryotic cell that's going to be found in the center of the cell, but it's not surrounded by a nuclear envelope. So there is no nucleus. We may have much, much smaller circles of DNA known as plasmids. In eukaryotes, we have straight chromosomes, and in order for them to fit within the nucleus, they're packaged using proteins known as histones. Histones are positively charged proteins. They're going to come together in a ball, and then the DNA wraps around these little ball-like structures so that the DNA can be condensed to fit within the nucleus. Bacteria don't have anything resembling histones, but the archaea do have something somewhat similar. That's one of the characteristics that connects the archaea with the eukaryotes. In prokaryotes, we don't have any organelles. In some cases, there may be internal membranes, but we don't have things like the Golgi, the ER, etc. We do, of course, have organelles within eukaryotes. If there's a cell wall present in prokaryotes, and there is in most, it's usually made of peptidoglycan. This is a compound that's found in bacteria but is not found in eukaryotes. In eukaryotes, there may or may not be a cell wall. If it is present, it's made of polysaccharide. So it's built around sugar molecules. So for instance, cellulose is made out of glucose. We see that in plant cells. We see something similar in fungi, and we'll talk about that later as well. In terms of division, in eukaryotes, we have these straight chromosomes. They all have to line up in the middle of the cell and they have to be pulled apart, and that's a rather complex process. That's known as mitosis if we're talking about asexual reproduction. If we're talking about the production of gametes in animals, for instance, that's meiosis. So we have these two highly specialized forms of cellular division.
in prokaryotes, dividing that circular chromosome and the circular plasmids is much simpler. And this occurs through a process known as binary fission. Here, once again, we're seeing our three domains of life, our three major categories of living things. We have the archaea, which are prokaryotes, no nucleus, no organelles, but also no known pathogens. We have the bacteria, which are also prokaryotes. There are quite a few pathogenic groups that we'll talk about in more detail. And the eukarya, which would include us, so we're animals, the fungi, and land plants. And each of those is a kingdom. So a kingdom is a smaller subdivision of a domain. Everything else within the eukarya is all grouped together into a kingdom known as protista. So how do we classify things? Well, it doesn't matter what you're classifying. You could be classifying living organisms, or you could go to a hardware store and classify, I don't know, nails or screws or something like that. In either case, you're placing things into groups. We have a big group and it's made up of smaller groups and that's made up of smaller groups, etc. It's kind of like the Russian dolls that you see at the bottom of this diagram. One doll fits inside another doll. So starting at the top, we have domains. We have three domains. We have the archaea, we have the bacteria, and we have the eukarya, the eukaryotes. Let's say that we were going to classify this panther. Well, it's made up of eukaryotic cells, so cells that have a nucleus and organelles, so it's part of domain eukarya. It's part of kingdom animalia. It's obviously not a plant or a fungus or a protista. Within kingdoms, we have phyla, or singular phylum. It belongs to the phylum chordata. It's a mammal. So the phyla are made up of classes. Mammals are defined by the fact that they have hair, although some of them have lost that, and they produce milk. It's within the order carnivora. It's within the family Felidae, that's the cats, the genus Panthera, and the species Panthera partis in this case. So that last bit there, Panthera partis, that is the very specific species name for this particular animal. And as mentioned, when we're defining a species, the easiest way to define a species, although it doesn't always work, is to think of a species as the largest population of organisms that can interbreed. Now, when we're classifying things, we try to look for shared similarities. Ideally, we look for shared similarities that tell us about relatedness. So all of the organisms that are within a family, for instance, should be closely related to each other. They should have evolved from a common ancestor not that long ago. Classification is also known as taxonomy. And as mentioned, ideally, we should also be including history evolutionary history, which is something known as phylogeny. Let's take a look at a very simple, perhaps a bit overly simple, example of how classification works. So what we have here is the classification of the domestic cat, and we're seeing a, a tree, a tree of relationships, sometimes referred to as a phylogenetic tree. So let's look at class mammalia. That would include the horse, the wolf, the leopard, and the domestic cat. Now, all mammals have nipples, they produce milk, and they also have hair. So we could set hair as a defining feature, a defining characteristic for this group. So the horse, the wolf, the leopard, the domestic cat, they all have hair or fur. Now, if we go up that tree and look at a smaller group, so a subset of the class mammalia, now we're looking at the order carnivora. These critters are all defined by the fact that they have carnivorous or meat-eating teeth. So they have canines and they have molars that are very sharp and pointy and act like scissors to 
cut off shards of meat. The horse, of course, doesn't have that, so the horse is excluded from that order. We can go up further, and now we have this one characteristic retractable clause that defines the family Philidae, which includes all the cats. So if you have a cat, you know that they can retract their claws. So we see that in the leopard, we see that in the domestic cat. Now, if we wanted to separate domestic cats from leopards, we could look at a characteristic such as the ability to purr, and it's not a great characteristic, actually. There are other cats that can do that, but let's pretend that's a good characteristic. That is something that we might use to define this smaller group. Now, note that we have another group here known as the out group. That would be the turtle in this case. The turtle is distantly related to all of these creatures. It is a vertebrate it has a backbone, it has a bunch of things that it shares with mammals, but it doesn't share the fur, it doesn't share the nipples or the milk production. This is something we can compare all of the other organisms on this chart to. So we can look at a horse and a wolf and we can try to separate them, but what we're looking for are characteristics that differ between them but also things that are not shared with the turtle. So we want to exclude characteristics that are common to the horse, the wolf, and the turtle, if we're trying to separate the horse and the wolf, because of course they're not gonna give us much information. The biological definition of a species is the largest population of organisms whose members can interbreed and produce viable fertile offspring. So for instance, all humans belong to the same species because you can take any two fertile humans and they could potentially produce offspring. Humans and chimpanzees are different species because you can't take a human and a chimpanzee, mate them and produce offspring. Doesn't work because we are separate species. Now, an important thing to note is that the mating has to produce viable, which means they survive, fertile offspring. So for instance, if you mate a horse and a donkey, you get a mule. So we do get offspring, but that mule is sterile. The only way to produce another mule is to mate another donkey and horse. Now, this definition kind of falls apart a bit when we're talking about microbes, especially prokaryotes. So when we're talking about prokaryotes, they don't actually have sex, as we'll see. They can swap bits and pieces of DNA, but they don't combine full sets of DNA together to make a zygote that develops into a new individual the way that we would. So prokaryotes don't have sex. So that makes this definition kind of useless. Also, bacteria of very different types can swap bits and pieces of DNA, even though they're not closely related. And the other thing is if we're looking at viruses, well, viruses can't even reproduce on their own. So for organisms that don't have sex, this definition is rather difficult, if not impossible, to apply. So in cases like that, we have to look at differences in metabolism, DNA sequences, etc. Let's say we have a couple of bacteria under the microscope. We're trying to figure out if they're different species. Well, the first thing we could look at, the most obvious thing, is the morphology or shape of the cell. Some bacterial cells are round, some are rod-shaped, some are kind of wiggly. That's a good place to start for obvious differences. We could also stain them with different dyes that are attached to different components of the cell wall. So we'll talk about gram staining later. We'll talk about that in great detail and we'll actually have a chance to do it in the lab, but that can identify different classes or groups of bacteria. We can look at biochemistry. We can look at different bacteria that might look very similar and figure out whether they're capable of breaking down certain molecules and using them as a food source. So all of those techniques are helpful, but what's used today mainly when we're trying to 
isolate different species that look very similar is DNA sequences. So we might look at the DNA that codes for ribosomal RNA, for instance. These are sequences that tend to change very, very slowly over time, and that makes them very useful for figuring out phylogenetic relationships, so evolutionary relationships. If we look at these ribosomal RNA sequences and we find that there is a 2 or 3% difference or more, then we can typically be assured that we're dealing with different species. And here's how we might do that. So we might look at a sequence for a particular gene, such as one of the genes that code for ribosomal RNA. And we would take that sequence from two different microbes, two different bacteria, for instance. We'd line them up and we would look for differences. So what you're seeing in the first example there, we have the sequence of the gene of one organism at the top. We have a sequence of a gene the same gene from a second organism below that. And wherever you see a vertical line, that's of course where the nucleotides are the same. But you can see we have some differences. So for example, here we have a C on the top and an A on the bottom. So at that particular location in organism one, we have a cytosine, but in organism two, we have an adenine. Uh, we can see over here that we have a G and a T, so that's a difference as well. And then over here we have a T and a G. The rest of the sequence lines up. Now what that suggests is that these organisms are closely related. They evolved from a common ancestor that had a common sequence, but they've been isolated from each other long enough that the sequences have started to change. Now, if we look at the example at the bottom, organism one and three, these are distantly related. And the way we know that is if we compare them to the first example, we can see a lot more mismatched pairs. There's been a lot more change and evolution between these two species. All right, so now once we've worked out these relationships, we need to name these organisms. And to do that, we use Latin. Now, Latin is not a language that is being used. We don't have any Romans running around nowadays. So there's no favoritism. I mean, if we named everything in English or French or whatever, some people would get bent out of shape. So we use Latin and there's no favoritism. People around the world, so biologists everywhere, will use the same Latin name for a particular species. So you can talk to a scientist in Europe and they'll know exactly what you're talking about if you're not using the common local name for a particular organism, but instead are using the scientific universally agreed upon name. When we write the name in Latin, it should be italicized or underlined. And that's just a, a rule of writing, basically. If you're writing an essay and you write a word within your essay and it's a different language from the rest of the text, so you're presumably writing in English and you include a word in uh, Italian or Latin or French or whatever, it should be italicized. So we always italicize Latin names. Now there's two parts to a Latin name. The first part is the genus and that is always capitalized as you can see in our example here. The second part is known as the specific epithet. That is not capitalized. So the example here is our proper Latin name which is Homo sapiens. Um, homo means man, sapien means wise. So the name means wise man. Another example might be Staphylococcus aureus. And pay attention to the names because they usually do tell you a little bit about the organism. Staphylococcus tells us about the shape of the cell and also its growth form. And we'll come back to that. Aureus means gold in Latin. And this is a bacterium that grows on a plate 
in colonies that are gold in color. And actually, you'll probably see those next week in the lab. More examples, we have Escherichia coli. Uh, we have Deinococcus radiodurans, which is an interesting bacterium I'll talk about in a moment. Note that you can also shorten these terms if you want. And if you shorten it, then you include the capital from the genus name and you include the whole name, lowercase, from the specific epithet. So Escherichia coli becomes E dot coli, for instance. Pay attention to that because you will see some of these names in the lab. So again, we always have this two-part naming system. It's referred to as the binomial naming system, bi meaning two. So for Staphylococcus aureus, again, the first part is the genus, that's going to be capitalized. The second part is the specific epithet that is not going to be capitalized. Staphylococcus describes the arrangement of the cells and the shape of the cells. Coccus means spherical, um, staphylo means clustered. And then the second part, aureus, refers to the golden color of the colonies. This is an interesting one. Dinococcus. So coccus means berry, literally, but it's used to describe a round or spherical bacterium. Dino means terrible. Dinosaur means terrible lizard. This means terrible berry. Radiodurans means it's resistant to radiation. This is a bacterium that is incredibly tough. Um, apparently the Guinness Book of World Records has decided it's the toughest bacterium. It is actually the toughest one that we know of just yet. It can survive freezing. It can survive completely drying out. You can put it in a vacuum and it will survive. It will survive exposure to radiation and to acidity and alkalinity. It's a really, really tough bacterium. Now, fortunately, it's not pathogenic. People are kind of worried, though, if something like this did become pathogenic, how would you get rid of this thing? Another concern that's kind of interesting is it won't be too long, hopefully, before we set foot on Mars. What if something like this attached itself to a spaceship? It would probably survive the journey and it could contaminate the Martian soil. It's an interesting thing that maybe I'll talk about later. I find it kind of fascinating. If we're sending off spacecraft that are exploring planets, especially if they're going to land on them or crash into them, we have to think about stuff like this because we could accidentally colonize a planet with something that came from Earth and is particularly resilient. Okay then, so let's take a very quick look at these groups. Again, we have our three domains. We have domain bacteria, we have domain archaea, and they make up the prokaryotes. And then we have domain eukarya, which consists of four kingdoms, kingdom protista, kingdom fungi, kingdom planta, which don't cause any infections, and kingdom animalia. The archaea are pretty incredible. A lot of them are extremophiles. File means to love. They love extreme conditions. They evolved when the earth was not a very pleasant place to live in. And they have remained within these extreme conditions because they have a hard time competing with bacteria. But there are some that can live in boiling water. If you've had an opportunity to go to Yellowstone, for instance, you may have noticed that the hot springs have really beautiful, pretty colors. Some of them are yellow, green, red, etc. And that's due to archaea that are living within that water that can be 70 degrees Celsius or more. There are archaea that live deep, deep below the surface, kilometers below the surface. There are archaea that can live in the upper atmosphere. And if we do find life, on Mars or other planets in our solar system, it's probably going to be something very similar to archaea. Of the prokaryotes, archaea don't cause us problems. Bacteria might. 
Most bacteria are not harmful, but there are a few that are pathogenic. Again, as mentioned, because they're prokaryotes, they don't have a nucleus, they don't have any internal organelles. Most of them possess a cell wall. It's made of peptidoglycan, although some of them have lost that cell wall. We talked about symbiosis in our last topic. Remember that symbiosis is a close relationship between two organisms. Endo means inside. Endosymbiosis is where we have one cell living inside of another cell. What you're seeing on the left here are termites. And as you know, termites eat wood. They break down the cellulose and they get energy from that food. Cellulose is a really tough material. It's really difficult to break down. Very few things can break down cellulose. And actually, termites can't do it either. Within the gut of the termite is a little protist. And that's what you're seeing on the right. So this little microscopic organism, it's a single cell, lives inside the gut of the termite. The termite will chew up wood and swallow it. And then that little organism will break it down. This is an organism known as Trichonympha. And if the termites didn't have that protist living in their guts, they would starve to death. In fact, the very first thing that a termite does when it hatches out of an egg is eat some of the poop that was deposited by other termites. So it picks up that organism. If you want to be mean to a termite, you can take some eggs out of a termite mound and put them into a sterile test tube, let them hatch out. They won't have that trichonympha and they will starve to death. They will eat wood and eat and eat and gorge themselves, but they won't be able to break the wood down. This goes a bit further because actually the trichonympha can't break down wood either. Within that cell, that trichonympha protist, we have bacteria. Bacteria are living inside that cell and the bacteria are the ones that actually break down the cellulose. They break down the cellulose, they pass on the uh, sugars that they liberate from the cellulose to the trichonympha, and it passes on the extra sugar to the termites, and then the termites get to eat what's left over. And it goes even further. Notice that that trichonympha has these feathery sort of appendages that look and function like flagella, those are actually bacteria as well. There are bacteria, spirochete bacteria, which are corkscrew shaped, that attach to the outside of the cell, spin around, and allow that trichonympha cell to move around. Here's another example of endosymbiosis, but this one's not quite as nice. The last example I gave you was an example of mutualism. So we had bacteria living inside trichonympha, that's a mutualistic relationship, and then the trichonympha were living inside of termites. And of course, they were both benefiting as well. So another example of mutualism. Here, what you're seeing is an endoparasite. So we have cells that line the interior of the urogenital tract in humans. And within these cells, you can see little dots. Those little dots are chlamydia bacteria. These are really tiny bacteria. In fact, they're among the smallest cells. They're almost virus-like in some ways because they can't survive very long outside of a cell. They enter into a cell and they kind of hijack the machinery of the cell to reproduce and complete their metabolism. So they're more complex than a virus, but they don't manufacture their own ATP. Instead, they steal ATP from your cells. And as we'll see, a lot of parasites become very, very simple. If they're dependent on another organism for resources, then there's less that they have to do. I mentioned earlier that mitochondria and also chloroplasts were derived from bacteria. Now this idea was presented first in 1970 by a researcher, Lynn Margulis, as the endosymbiotic theory. Now what she proposed 
was that bacteria had become permanently incorporated into cells. And she suggested that if this was the case, we should find DNA within the mitochondria. At the time, in 1970, we had no way of detecting the small quantities of DNA that were found within mitochondria. But several years later, we were able to do so, and we proved her theory correct. There's now lots and lots of evidence that mitochondria were originally trapped bacteria. Now, how did they end up in the ancestral eukaryotic cell? No one's quite sure. There's a few things that might have happened. It might have been that the bacteria that gave rise to mitochondria were endoparasites, a lot like chlamydia. Or it might be that we had uh, eukaryotic cells, pro-eukaryotic cells, so ancestral eukaryotic cells, that engulfed bacteria and tried to consume them, but were unable to do so. That's something that happens quite often as well. It happens within your own body. For instance, the bacterium that causes tuberculosis, your white blood cells will try to gobble it up, but they can't break it down and the cells will actually grow and reproduce within your white blood cells. So in any case, we had bacteria cells that were living inside these archaean cells, dividing within them, and this became a permanent relationship and this gave rise to eukaryotic cells. You can see that happening here. So we have our ancestral prokaryote, probably an archaean cell, and we can see that some of the external membrane folded in and gave rise to internal membranes that made up the nucleus and endoplasmic reticulum and so on. And then we had these heterotrophic prokaryotes, prokaryotes that were breaking down food with the help of oxygen that became incorporated as mitochondria. And in some eukaryotes, we had these photosynthetic prokaryotes that became incorporated as chloroplasts. The mitochondria that are found within our cells have two membranes. The outer membrane is very similar to the plasma membrane of our cells. The inner membrane of the mitochondria is quite different it resembles the plasma membrane of bacterial cells. In fact, that inner membrane has little electric motors embedded within it. We don't see those motors anywhere else in our cells. We see them in bacteria. Those little electric motors are what cause the flagella of bacteria to spin. And the electric motor in the mitochondria is involved in the production of ATP. Basically, the mitochondria is like a battery. So hydrogen protons are stockpiled between the two membranes. They flow back into the interior of the mitochondria through these electric motors, and that energy potential, that electric potential, is used to generate ATP. So why might that be the case? Well, let's imagine that we have our Archean cell, and let's say that it's going to ingest or eat a bacterial cell. So I'll show the archaean cell in blue and I'll show the bacterial cell in red. Now, after this is ingested, what are we going to be left with? Well, we're going to be left with our bacteria cell on the interior. And now it's going to be surrounded by a bit of membrane, plasma membrane, that forms a food vacuole, basically. And it doesn't take much to imagine that inner membrane that I've shown as red as becoming convoluted to give rise to these folds, these cristae, and then we're left with the mitochondria. Also within the mitochondria, we have a circle of DNA. Where else do we see circles of DNA? Well, we see them in prokaryotes. We don't have any circles of DNA within the nucleus because that's not a eukaryotic thing. Eukaryotes have straight pieces or linear pieces of DNA. This is a remnant of the bacterial chromosome. Most of the genes have been lost. We only have 37 left, 
but those are critical genes. They code for proteins that are essential for metabolism. So the proteins that make up the electron transfer chain, for instance, are contained within the human mitochondrial DNA circle. Another thing to note is that within mitochondria, we have ribosomes. Mitochondria have their own ribosomes. They have their own transfer RNAs. And you can see that some of these genes code for transfer RNAs that are very similar to bacterial transfer RNAs. In fact, the mitochondria behaves somewhat independently from the rest of your cell. It reproduces on its own, it's, it does its own thing. However, the mitochondria cannot live outside of your cell. It's lost so many genes that it is now dependent on your cell. There are quite a few researchers that are trying to reintroduce genes to mitochondria and see if they can get them to live on their own. Sounds like a really nerdy thing to do, and it is, but this would show for sure that yes, mitochondria are kind of misplaced bacteria. If you remember back to high school, you might recognize this diagram. If you don't, don't worry, we're going to talk about this before too long, but this is a general overview of cellular respiration. This is the process by which you break down food and liberate energy. So we have glycolysis that occurs in the cytosol, in the liquid fluid portion of the cytoplasm, and then we have the Krebs cycle and the electron transport chain that occur within the mitochondria. This is where most of the ATP is manufactured. So that last step, the electron transport chain, generates the vast majority of ATP that is available to your cells. Those last two steps, the Krebs cycle and the electron transport chain, require oxygen. That's why you breathe in oxygen. And it's interesting because oxygen is kind of a destructive element. I mean, it oxidizes things, it destroys things. So when you breathe in oxygen, it's gobbled up by the mitochondria. The mitochondria use it to liberate energy. At the same time, they save you from the destructive effects of oxygen. They scrounge all that oxygen. Carbon dioxide, incidentally, is an output of the Krebs cycle. So if I haven't made you fall in love with microbes yet, consider this. The mitochondria in your cells are derived from bacteria. If you didn't have those mitochondria, then for each molecule of glucose ingested into one of your cells, you would only get two ATP. As it is, the mitochondria can extract about 36 or 38 ATP from one molecule of glucose. This level of energy makes multicellular life possible. It means that you can have a nervous system and you can do all sorts of other very energetic things. Also, um, bacteria, cyanobacteria, gave rise to chloroplasts. Cyanobacteria themselves produce a lot of oxygen, but of course plants and algae produce oxygen, but plants and algae contain chloroplasts, which once again are enslaved photosynthetic bacteria. These plants release oxygen that is then used by your mitochondria. Chloroplasts and mitochondria make the world go round. So go out and hug a prokaryote. But let's move on to eukaryotes. Let's talk about how we can define different groups of eukaryotes. One of the ways we might do this is based on how they take up nourishment, how they feed themselves. So in eukaryotes like ourselves, we do this through ingestion. What that means is we take in food in large chunks and then we break it down in our digestive system. The breakdown occurs within our bodies. Now we could use the term ingestion to refer to a single-celled organism. An amoeba, for instance, might take in an entire bacterial cell and then that cell is broken down within the amoeba. This is rather different from what happens in fungus. So here we've got a toadstool or mushroom and this incidentally is just the fruiting body. This is the sexual structure, this is where spores are produced, the vast majority of that mushroom is underground. What the fungus does 
is it's going to secrete enzymes into the soil. The enzymes will break down organic matter in the soil. So digestion occurs outside of the body, outside of the fungus. The smaller molecules that result, so the nucleotides and amino acids, can then be soaked in. If we're looking at algae or plants, they're generating their food through photosynthesis. So they have chloroplasts that can be used to capture sunlight, and then that sunlight energy is used to manufacture sugar. Now plants also have mitochondria. The mitochondria will then break down that sugar, and that can be used as a source of energy. So their cells are like our cells, but they have chloroplasts as well. So imagine if I placed a cake in front of you. If you were ingestive, which you are, you would simply reach out and grab a chunk of that and eat it. If you were absorptive, what you might be able to do, it would be a cool trick, you might be able to take your hand, stick it into the cake, release enzymes, turn the cake into goo, and then absorb that through your skin. If you were photosynthetic, of course, you wouldn't care about the cake at all. You'd just go outside and lie in the sun. The four kingdoms of Eukarya can be defined as follows. Animalia consists of multicellular eukaryotes. They're always multicellular. These are organisms that ingest nutrients and they have an extracellular matrix. So they don't have a rigid cell wall. Instead, they have this layer of proteins around the outside. This would include sponges, which are almost animals. They're kind of on the cusp. And then we have vertebrates and invertebrates. Plants are multicellular, but they're photosynthetic and they do have a cell wall. The cell wall is made out of cellulose. Fungi are absorptive. They absorb nutrients. They excrete exoenzymes. Those are enzymes that leave the body of the fungus or leave the cells of the fungus, they break down materials outside of the cells and then the broken down nutrients are absorbed in. Fungi can be either unicellular or multicellular. They do have a cell wall and it's made out of something called chitin, which is similar to cellulose, but a bit different. And then protists are organisms that don't fit into those three kingdoms. It's kind of a, a grab all for everything that doesn't fit into the fungi, plantae, or animalia. We can also define these three groups based on how they reproduce, based on their life cycles. Animals have the simplest life cycle. And this is what you've been taught in high school, I assume. I don't imagine you talked much about the life cycles of fungi and plants their life cycles are kind of odd. So in animals, we have a diploid multicellular stage. That's the adult stage. And we have a very, very short-lived haploid stage. The haploid stage consists of single cells. So the only haploid part of our life cycle are the gametes. That would be the egg and the sperm. So we have meiosis, within the testes and ovaries that are going to take diploid cells and use them to generate haploid gametes. The haploid gametes come together, that's known as fertilization or syngamy, that produces a zygote. The zygote undergoes lots and lots of mitosis and we're back to our multicellular diploid stage. Here's a somewhat simplified version of that. So only the diploid stage is multicellular, and that is the dominant stage in the life cycle. We have these single-celled haploid gametes that immediately come back together to form a diploid zygote, and then mitosis brings us back to the diploid multicellular stage. Fungi are quite a bit different. In fungi, the dominant stage tends to be the haploid stage, and the haploid stage is multicellular. The diploid stage, on the other hand, is a single cell. So what fungi do 
is they produce gametes through mitosis. Now that might bend your mind a bit, but what happens is we have this haploid multicellular organism that produces free cells, gametes, that are haploid, and it produces them through mitosis. So mitosis always conserves the ploidy number, and haploid cells can undergo mitosis. It doesn't happen in animals like us, but it happens in lots of other critters. Those gametes come together to form a diploid zygote, a single cell that will immediately undergo meiosis and produce four haploid cells that will then undergo mitosis to give rise to a haploid multicellular organism. So this is kind of the opposite of what animals do. There can also be a multicellular dikaryotic stage. And I'm not gonna get into that right now. I'll come back to that. But we can actually have multicellular forms where the cells have two separate haploid nuclei. So a typical fungus, something like a mushroom, spends most of its time just living as a mass of strands of cells within the soil. That's what you're seeing in the photograph on the bottom right. You're seeing this silky kind of material, which consists of kind of like a spaghetti network of cells. Every so often, some of these strands will come together and they'll coordinate the production of an actual mushroom which is a fruiting body. It produces spores. That's its only function. It pops up every so often to produce spores. In fact, some fungi can be huge. They live in the soil. And in some cases, one single fungus, one organism can be a kilometer or more in size. It's really quite incredible. And they'll pop up these spore producing structures. And within those spore producing structures, zygotes are formed. They immediately undergo meiosis to produce haploid spores that are dumped into the wind and float off somewhere and give rise to new strands of cells. The strands of cells are known as hyphae. Again, don't worry about that too much just yet. We will come back to that. And plants, well, they're straight up kind of kinky. They have what's known as an alternation of generations. When we're talking about reproduction, the generation, so one generation to the next, generation refers to the multicellular stage. So of course, when we're talking about generations of humans, we're talking about the multicellular stage. We're not considering the gametes as a generation. Well, plants, alternate between a haploid multicellular form and a diploid multicellular form. So if we look at a fern, for instance, a fern will release a haploid spore. That spore will germinate within the soil and it grows into a multicellular haploid heart-shaped organism. That heart-shaped organism, and it's pretty small, it's less than a centimeter across, it lives half buried into the soil will produce sperm and egg. The sperm and the egg will meet in the soil and give rise to a zygote. The zygote develops into a multicellular diploid fern, the fern that you're familiar with. And then that fern undergoes meiosis to produce spores that are haploid. And then that completes our alternation of generations. But again, Similar to what happens in the fungus, the gametes, the sperm and the egg, are produced by mitosis and not meiosis because they're produced by a haploid multicellular individual. I find plants absolutely fascinating, but of course they're not infectious, so we're not going to talk about that. But there are multicellular, diploid, and haploid stages. So the take home message here is that sex is really kind of simple and boring in animals, as fun as it might be. So just a few quick examples of these different categories of organisms. Animalia, multicellular. They have an extracellular matrix instead of a cell wall, and the majority are ingestive. 
we have roundworms here we have tapeworms down the bottom right we have flukes which are worms that in this case might be found in the liver but there's other forms that might be found in blood vessels or in the lungs in the middle top we have a tick which of course can transfer bacterial pathogens from one host to another and then below that we have a bed bug now bed bugs actually are generally fairly clean but there may be some cases where they can transfer pathogens as well plants of course can make their own food they don't have to worry about parasitizing other organisms although there are some interesting plants that parasitize other plants but I searched and searched and I can't find any that parasitize humans unfortunately because I'd love to talk about plants more but I won't get an opportunity to do so except of course for this very quickly we have a sloth at the top and this sloth is really creepy looking but he's also covered in algae does the algae harm the sloth no probably not down the bottom I found this case kind of interesting there's an elderly man here with a suppressed immune system and he swallowed a pea and the pea went down the wrong tube ended up in his lung and actually germinated it's not very clear on the x-ray there but that's what's going on is it parasitizing him no not really anyway I guess I have to give up on the plants fungi can of course be parasitic athlete's foot for example is caused by a parasitic fungus that lives on the skin uh, ringworm sounds like it's caused by a worm but it's actually circles found on the skin that are caused by infectious fungi we can have yeast infections as well and what you're seeing in the upper right are yeast cells now down the bottom we have a toadstool or mushroom if you have mushrooms growing on you you probably have more important problems to worry about in the middle we have an orange and on that orange we have a fungus known as penicillium and you can see that on the far right up close under the microscope you can see spores that are being produced by penicillium you might recognize why penicillium is important it produces penicillin and we will of course come back to that one and the eukaryotes that are left over that don't fit into the animalia or the fungi or the plantae kingdoms are grouped together into the protista kingdom the majority are single celled the majority are not harmful but there are a few pathogenic forms there are some that are blood parasites there are some that will infect the vagina there are some that will infect the digestive tract what you're seeing here are the relationships between the different groups of protists and the well-established other three kingdoms so the plantae the fungi and the animalia as you can see the relationships are quite complicated biologists will be working on this for decades to come trying to figure out how all this should be sorted out traditionally the protists have been divided into three broad groups based on how they receive their nourishment this is highly simplified but it'll do for the moment we'll come back to the protists in more detail later but we have ingestive protists that take in food in big chunks and this group is referred to as the protozoa so we have amoeba and we have paramecia in this group then we have absorptive protists so these are protists that behave as fungi so the water molds what you're seeing here is a poor little goldfish that is covered in something that is appropriately named ick this is a water mold it looks a lot like fungus and uh, water molds are quite often confused with fungi and then we have our photosynthetic protists and these are known as algae so these are common non-technical terms for protists based entirely on how they feed themselves and let's not forget the infectious agents that are not technically alive we have viruses and we also have 
prions. Okay, so that was a rather quick and dirty overview of the classification of the different organisms that we're going to look at. We will come back and look at each of these groups in more detail. But I'll leave you to read through the concepts and also to look at the terminology. And I have a few study questions for you here.